Now, if you go down though, you'll notice that Narrable, the Diana ball beats it out at 8.2. Now, if you look at the rest of the column, what are the only, what is the only compounds that outperform Diana ball and Echisterone in this? We have Turkesterone, Triacetate, and the most potent of all of the anabolic agents in this study, So guys, Derek, moreplacemoreaids.com. Today we're going to be talking about different pathways of growth as well as me going back onto anabolics. So I'll get into the details in a bit here, but basically something I've realized over the years is that there are many different pathways of growth in the body. It's not all regulated through androgen receptor activation. And this is probably a big reason why selective androgen receptor modulators have such a low ceiling in terms of their ability to grow muscle. Like it seems like there's a very, uh, the cap at which diminishing return sets in is um, a lot lower than with anabolic androgenic steroids, which, you know, don't just interact through the AR. They actually have a lot of downstream um, effects on other receptors. And to be honest, I think SARMs do too. I think it's just the studies imply tissue selectivity and, um, androgen receptor modulation in a selective manner in which I think they also have, they probably act similarly to anabolic androgenic steroids where they have like, you know, unpredictable interaction with other like satellite receptors in the body, like glucocorticoid receptors, mineral corticoid receptors, etc., And it produces kind of like unpredictable effects. But with that being said, their main, they were designed to agonize the AR specifically, whereas Anabolics were also designed to do like be tissue selective, but they also have downstream um, interaction with a lot of different things. Like some compounds like Anadrol, for example, it has like an undetectable binding affinity for the androgen receptor, yet it's like one of the most potent muscle builders out there. And it does like all this other crazy shit. So one of the things that I found more in the past like year or so is all of the different pathways that some of these like metabolite interactions actually happen through and how that influences muscle growth and strength building and how that can be leveraged to design a more optimized protocol where you're not just picking things that hammer the AR over and over, like that overlap significantly and you're just competing essentially for the same receptor activation with a bunch of different compounds that are not designed to take advantage of all these other vectors that could be, you know, have a little bit here at, you know, something that fully takes advantage of the AR. Then you have something that fully takes advantage of this and fully takes advantage of this. And this is sort of where, you know, I started to get into um, compounds that excel in a anti, anti catabolic context was like one of the first things I learned about where it was things that antagonize glucocorticoid receptors, which then could be used in a cutting phase to enhance, you know, muscle retention, um, and get a significant recomp effect while you have something else that agonizes the AR potently, like things that stack alongside each other, which hit multiple different vectors in the body can be leveraged to create a more overall comprehensive cycle that is also probably more well tolerated because it's like more focused action on certain areas. You don't have a bunch of overlapping drug interaction and using unnecessary amounts of compounds that kind of just do the same thing and then overlap and spill over and cause like side effects as opposed to like targeted minimum effective dose at each vector. So some of these different vectors I've come to realize in the past years that are actually important that are often neglected, we have an androgen receptor agonist. So this is, you know, whatever your anabolic of choice is, there's quite a few potent AR agonists at our disposal, you know, some notable, you know, Primabolin, Nandrolone, there's a lot of different ones, um, but uh, I'm not gonna get into the rabbit hole of that. There's glucocorticoid receptor antagonism as well through compounds like uh, Trenbolone is exceptional at that. Anivar is also quite good. And then there's other um, vectors too, of course, that I've probably, I've briefly touched on some of these other ones in some of my other videos, like for example, with women, something that is often, uh, well, not often, but it's uh, intelligently deployed by those who know kind of what they're doing is um, like a low dose um, beta 2 adrenergic receptor agonist like clenbuterol, not for, you know, like a high dose for fat burning, but to um, kind of leverage that mTOR interaction to kind of get a muscle growth outcome that 
is a, via a totally different mechanism than just like ha hammering the AR. Like I mentioned, it's like a non-androgenic means of stimulating muscle growth. Uh, in addition, like AR density, upregulating AR content in the muscle, L-carnitine, injectable L-carnitine is another thing. You know, there's so many different avenues that go kind of like untapped that you could otherwise just like get a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here and get an overall like comprehensive, more potent effect with a relative lack of side effects, ideally. So another vector that is unaddressed almost entirely and, you know, I guess partially addressed by some, but often uh, I feel like by accident is estrogen receptor agonism. So this is typically accomplished through 17 beta estradiol via the aromatization of testosterone. So this is the most potent ER beta agonist in the body, um, like endogenously as well as typically in a cycle um, because most people don't uh, really focus on this. And I guess indirectly through other synthetic anabolics, you can get some like byproduct interaction with that. Um, some of them, you know, like nandrolone has a bit of an effect. Anadrol seems to be interact with it to some extent, maybe trestolone. I'm not saying to use any of those, but I'm trying to say that this is another avenue that has proven that it actually has, uh, it's heavily involved in skeletal muscle hypertrophy. And this is where the first kind of like glimpse I got into this was the fact that a lot of individuals that I respect in this community that have a more like uh, forward thinking or a more, I don't know, like uh, not creative, but just like they're just fucking smart where they think of all these different things and different interactions to maximize the minimum effective dose at every vector. They were deploying injectable ectosterone to agonize the estrogen receptor beta. So rather than just relying on the aromatization of testosterone to estradiol, they were actually using exogenous injectable ectosterone to agonize the estrogen receptor beta, and they were getting good results from it. And this is something I basically, another thing I had written off entirely in the past is ectosteroids. This is something that you've probably seen hyped up at some point. These are anthropod steroid hormones that are mainly responsible for molting development and to a lesser extent reproduction. Examples of ectosteroids include ectosone, ectosterone, tercesterone, and 2-deoxyectosone. These compounds are synthesized in anthropods from dietary cholesterol upon metabolism by the Halloween family of cytochrome P450s. Phyto phytoectosteroids also appear in many plants, mostly as a protection, as protection ed agents against herbivore insects. And that is the Wikipedia summarization. But when you actually dig into the literature, we see selective estrogen receptor beta activation stimulates skeletal muscle growth and regeneration. And we get into these kind of studies which actually um, isolate estrogen receptor beta to see how potent it really is. So here, for example, in this study, they had the levator ante, which is often used as a proxy for muscle growth. And I'm not saying it's an accurate way to do that, but it is what we have from rodent models often to deal with and is kind of like the basis for our experimentation in the future. So this is basically looking at the mean weight of what is to be the proxy of muscle tissue. And here they have um, intact, which is non-castrated um, essentially. They have the castrated and you can see how much muscle growth drops when you castrate um, a rodent, obviously, as you would expect. Um, and then once you introduce Let's see. So once you introduce testosterone propionate into the equation, you get all of a sudden a restoration of muscle weight. So obviously use exogenous testosterone in somebody who's castrated, you're going to be able to regain that muscle because you now have enough endogenous or you have enough exogenous testosterone to replace what was otherwise maintaining muscle. So the way you know that this is actually working is because when they introduce an antiandrogen, you can see here flutamide, this is an antiandrogen a primitive one that is used uh, used to be used for hair loss prevention. Basically, it it's an anti-androgen whereby it would by binding to it, it would prevent testosterone from inducing its effects through the AR. So remember earlier how I was talking about AR activation and you know leading to muscle growth. That's the main vector by which most people use anabolic steroids to grow from. If you use flutamide and you ingest it, which don't do by the way, it's fucking horrible for you, and it's a very primitive anti-androgen. All of a sudden, muscle growth drops to almost the equivalent of a castration rodent. And the reason being is because the flutamide is occupying the androgen receptors and preventing the testosterone from doing what it needs to do. So even though you're literally using, see here, it's still using testosterone. So even though there's still testosterone in the body, it can't, if it can't get to the AR and do what it's supposed to do, 
it's not gonna do anything. So even though you have a high testosterone level in your body, if it's not binding to AR, it's not doing shit. So flutamide totally prevented the muscle growth. So this is why it's almost the equivalent of the castration, even though the intact and testosterone groups are way up here. So the way you can see where the estrogen receptor plays into this is because, okay, if you have flutamide, which is binding to the androgen receptor and preventing testosterone from building muscle, Anything else that happens aside from the androgen receptor, if something builds muscle above and beyond what's going on with the lack of AR activation, that's muscle growth above and beyond what your baseline is. So we can conclude that if you use an agonist of estrogen receptor beta on top of that anti-androgen anti activity, whatever muscle growth you get above and beyond that must be from the estrogen receptor agonist. So here we have um, the estrogen receptor beta selective agonist, and here it says possesses anabolic potency in healthy male skeletal muscle and stimulates IGF-1 mRNA expression. Um, so we can see here the beta group, this is the estrogen receptor beta agonist, builds muscle and is about halfway to the point of testosterone propionate. So it's obviously not as potent, but it still builds muscle. And we can see this clearly because a not a castrated rodent would not jump from 220 uh, milligrams per kilogram body weight up to whatever this is 400 you know like for no reason this is simply via the introduction of this estrogen receptor agonist now here when you look on the very right side notice how it has here is estrogen receptor beta agonist plus testosterone propionate builds more muscle than testosterone propionate on its own. So we can conclude, okay, if your baseline with testosterone propionate is restoration of mean levator any weight up to roughly, I don't know, like 650 milligrams per kilogram-ish. And now when you introduce this estrogen receptor beta selective agonist, it goes up to about, I don't know, 750. Like that's another 100 milligrams per kilogram body weight of tissue that you've added simply by adding this external compound that is operating via a totally different vector entirely. So as we can see here, it does actually make a difference. And if you look at the IGF-1 levator anti intervention, you can see here full induction of a castrated versus intact. We have this drop from about eight down to almost one when you introduce Estrogen receptor beta agonist, it goes up a little bit. When you introduce testosterone propionate, it jumps up a significant amount. But when you have the antiandrogen, it drops very significantly as expected. But when you have estrogen receptor beta agonist, I can't even fucking talk. Estrogen receptor beta agonist stacked on top of testosterone propionate, all of a sudden you get this jump up to here. Whereas on their own, in a monotherapy context, they were both much lesser so. So we can see there is a very substantial, you know, depending on how you want to define substantial, um, stimulation of skeletal muscle growth via this separate vector of estrogen receptor beta agonism. And this is where these ectosteroids become interesting because if you look at some of the other studies on it, we can see here, estrogen receptor beta is involved in skeletal muscle hypertrophy induced by the phytoectosteroid ectosterone. So in this one, it was a rodent model as well. And yeah, you know, take from that, you know, extrapolate as you will, but this is just, this is a novel kind of approach that I am detailing in this video anyway. So obviously we're going into this with a open mind that we're not just shitting on research that is rodent based because maybe it's viable. And from anecdotal reports that I've seen, it seems like these are actually worth pursuing or else I wouldn't have spent the last four months digging into all this shit. Um, so anyways, in this, they say the phytoectosteroid ectosterone was reported to stimulate protein synthesis and enhance physical performance. The aim of the study was to investigate underlying molecular mechanisms, particularly in the role of estrogen receptor beta. So basically they go into, um, elucidating the role of estrogen receptor beta in uh, hypertrophy and basically the conclusion was these findings provide new therapeutic perspectives for the treatment of muscle injury sarcopenia and cachectic disease but also imply that such substance could be abused for doping purposes so in this study they found that ectosterone was so worthwhile in exploring for anabolic muscle growth stimulation that it should be put on a doping list and this is where wada actually intervened and added it in 2020 to their monitoring program. Ectosterone was included in the monitoring program, monitoring program to assess patterns of prevalence of misuse. While other ectosteroids exist, 
most data, especially concerning effects on athletic performance and stakeholder comment center around ectosterone. And consequently, it was added to the monitoring program of 2020. If you fast forward to 2021's updates, you can see that it is still on the monitoring program for in and out of competition. So obviously the monitoring program, it's not officially banned yet, but they are highly considering it. And this is where, like, for example, in 2018, they actually had um, telmasartan on the monitoring program until they took it off because they didn't feel that uh, it was worth keeping on the banned list. They were looking at its effects on PPR, PPAR gamma and delta and kind of determining if it had some sort of uh, ability to replicate the same effects that carterine had via the same mechanism. Well, in like in a much weaker context, it's agonism of the same pathway of carterine. And it was found that uh, it wasn't prevalent enough to or potent enough to be worthwhile for addicts. So they removed it. And that's sort of how they gauge if a compound is something that should be added to their doping list or not. So for ectosterone, it is on their monitoring list right now, but notably, it is the most well-known one, so that's why it's on their doping list, but there's other ectosteroids too that aren't even on the monitoring list, and the main one isn't even on the banned list yet. And ectosterone is actually not even the most potent one, which is what we're gonna be getting into next, is something called terkesterone, which is something that um, I kind of came to know about um, indirectly through the study where they compared um, the anabolic activity of different ectosteroids or phytoectosteroids and steranobol. So here they basically compared actual like anabolic steroids to these ectosteroids in, uh, you have to keep in mind though, this again is not in humans. It is in fact in a rodent model. So here, when you go down to table one, we can see the effect of phytoectosteroids and steranobols on the weight gain of male rats in various ages and hormonal states. So we have castrated versus non-castrated. We have puberal versus impuberal. And then we have the multiple compounds being compared here in terms of their efficacy and weight gain. So without getting too confusing, basically you want to see which ones are gaining the most weight. And then those are, you know, pr probably the ones most worth exploring in terms of a hypertrophy context. So here we have ectosterone, one of the most notable of the phytoectosteroids, um, and probably the most well-known one. That's the one that's on the monitoring list for WADA. Here we have terkesterone, and this is another potent phytoectosteroid that I took note of because of this data here. And then above and beyond that, we have some actual anabolic androgenic steroids like methyl androstenediol, diol, and notably, Nerobol. Now, what is Nerobol? It's actually another name for Dianabol. So methandrostenolone, we're actually comparing a very potent anabolic steroid here, which is a very potent substrate for aromatase that otherwise artificially inflates your weight a lot with water weight too. So this weight gain from the Nerobol is also going to be artificially inflated by the water weight. It's not lean gains like with the phytoectosteroids. So when we look at the weight gain, basically we want to see which ones had the most potent effect on gaining overall mass. So ectosterone, one of the uh, pro the main ecti phytoectosteroid that is the most well known. So one on the monitoring list right now for WADA, um, 7.9. So if you actually look at the comparisons between all the different compounds, it's one of the most potent. Now, if you go down though, you'll notice that Nerobol, the Dianabol, beats it out at 8.2. Now, if you look at the rest of the column, what are the only what is the only compound that outperformed Dianabol and Ectosterone in this? We have Terkesterone, Triacetate, and the most potent of all of the anabolic agents in this study, Terkesterone. Just plain out Terkesterone at 8.5 weight gain up here. So now let's go into the other group of male rats. So here in an intact group of impuberal rodents, we have the weight gain again. So the control group, 15.3. So we look at the an anabolic agents and we look at which one's the most potent. Ectosterone, 27.9. Going down to Dianabol, 32.7. So it beats out Ectosterone. Now, which one is the most potent in this entire list? Let's look, 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 look. Again, Terkesterone, 33.9. It is the most potent anabolic agent on this whole list. Again, beating out Dianabol a second time. Now let's go into the third group, the castrated group. So this is a group that otherwise has no estrogen production too because they don't have any endogenous testosterone being aromatized into estradiol, which is going to have a deleterious effect on muscle growth and the GH-IGF-1 axis. So if you have something that outperforms 
Diana ball in this group, that's very substantial because Diana ball aromatizes into estrogen and can kind of replace that pathway of growth. So here we have the weight gain control, 12.5. Going through the column, we have ectosterone at 18.1. Diana ball shits on it at 27.8. And when you look up, we have turkesterone cl clocking in at 20.8, which is still of the compounds that aren't substrates for aromatase, it's the best one again. So, you know, comparing it to all the phytoecticeroids, it is the most potent one of all. So this is the one that I obviously became the most interested in personally and wanted to experiment with. So it doesn't necessarily mean, like you have to keep in mind here, when you're castrated, it would be like you doing a winstrol only cycle or you doing like a anivar only cycle or something. All right, what's a better, yeah, like exactly. Like something that is not a substrate for aromatase, you're gonna operate with zero estrogen if you are castrated and then you take a exogenous anabolic at the same time. Like obviously you're gonna grow like shit if you don't have some sort of fulfilling that pathway. So even though turkesterone and ectosterone are estrogen receptor, receptor beta agonists, it doesn't mean you still don't need estrogen in your body. Like obviously you still need to backfill that pathway with a test base in some capacity or some sort of estrogen or a compound that is a substrate for aromatase. So that's why the D-ball in this group completely blows it out of the water. But you have to keep in mind of all the compounds, it's still the strongest. And in the groups that had sufficient estrogen in their body, the turkesterone outperforms the Dianabol. So anything outperforming Dianabol that is like over the counter is kind of fucking mental. So to begin with, so I don't need, like it, it doesn't even need, even if it was half as potent, like obviously it would be worth exploring if it was uh, not liver toxic and didn't suppress your endogenous hormones, which is what we're going to get into next because in actual animal or in actual human studies, uh, animal studies, it does not appear to affect endocrine parameters substantially whatsoever. So in some of the studies done on humans using ectosterone, they actually found no suppression of LH or FSH or testosterone levels, nor did they see any toxicity in liver enzyme values or anything like that. So it's actually very promising. It actually looks very well tolerated. Now, as far as the actual effect it has on humans and how potent it is at building muscle, it's much less impressive in these studies that I could find in humans compared to these animal models. Like these animal models, you would assume this is like, like the fucking best thing ever, like blowing fucking Diana ball out of the water, blowing out literally everything. In actual application, it's not as good as it seems. So you're not gonna build 10 pounds of muscle in fucking six weeks using turkesterone. However, something that does not suppress LH, FSH, testosterone at all, is not liver toxic, does not seem to have any deleterious impact to hormonal markers whatsoever, is non-androgenic, you have to keep in mind, this is interacting through estrogen receptor beta, not through the androgen receptor. So we're not having any androgenic effects coming from this compound. So this means that somebody, regardless if they're a male or female, should be able to deploy this without a risk of viralization or masculinization. So this is where it becomes a very interesting compound as well for me as somebody who is very concerned about not using anabolics because I don't want to cause hair loss. I don't want to cause androgenic side effects, etc. So for me, even if this is like, I don't even like if it was as good as Steve ball, I'd be all over this shit, obviously. But even if it was one quarter or one eighth or one sixteenth as good as D ball, if it had this little of an impact side effect wise, based on what I see in the human literature and it produced even like a fraction of the outcome, I would be all over it because it doesn't cause any hair loss and it can be used without any androgenic effects whatsoever. And it's via a totally different vector than testosterone or other synthetic AAS that are mainly like, like testosterone is pretty broad spectrum and it's effects. So yeah, it's not just through the AR, but I mean, like if you're going to stack something on top of testosterone in your head, you're probably shooting for something that's a potent agonist of AR. You're going to go for Primo or something, something tissue selective. That's what the whole goal of stacking novel anabolic agents on top is. But if we already have that pathway kind of like topped out, the, you know, we already have enough testosterone as a base in there. We can, even if you're a natural, you don't even have to worry about it because your endogenous testosterone production stays intact. So this is where these ectosteroids become very interesting for me because they operate via this totally different pathway. So not only could it be viable for people on gear already, but for naturals who don't want to shut themselves down, can't use pro hormones, can't use steroids, can't use whatever, they would be able to use this and technically retain their natty status, depending on who's interpreting it, probably not pop in drug tests because this is not yet added to a banned substance list and get some sort of performance enhancing advantage without, you know, 
having to actually go into the dark side of like shutting themselves down. So as well as no androgenic activity. So this is so promising to me that I had some guinea pigs run it. I got it myself. And this is when I, the whole point of this video, like me saying I'm going back on anabolics, like this is, this is the anabolic that I've added. So this is, I'm not actually doing like, you know, like actual gear on top. This is what's stacking on top of TRT now. And this is what I'm going to see how potent it is. And this is actually a video for a product launch where we actually have Turkesterone available now through Gorilla Mine. And this is very difficult to get, getting the standardization that is needed too for it to be potent enough to actually do something. And this is largely going to be an experimental product launch. I actually do not know how good it is going to be individual to individual. We had some guinea pigs who actually had good results. Personally, the only reason I was interested in it to begin with is because I have friends who I actually defer to and trust who actually had good results from ectesterone and turkesterone. And I had wanted to make sure that it was not just the guys using injectable, that the guys using oral actually had good results too. And this is where it gets a bit more complicated because the bioavailability of these compounds comes into question when you start to talk about oral ingestion. And this is where, you know, just having plain ectesterone does not seem to do very much. So this is where I started to dig into the literature on cyclodextrin complexes. And this is where I found that the uh, bioavailability of ectesterone, like basically the literature suggested that cyclodextrin was a good basis for the creation of a hydrophilic substance. So they expected that the complex um, ectesterone with a cyclodextrin complex allowed for increased bioavailability and pharmacological effect on the organism, which is, you know, whoever's ingesting it. So, so I started to dig into cyclodextrins and solubility and bioavailability and whatnot, because basically, again, getting into, it sort of circles back to the carnitine discussion. It's a very useful addition that is non-androgenic and actually makes a difference, but it's another thing I don't want to inject on a daily basis. So even if I could use injectable ectosterone or tecasterone and get a very potent effect from it, or at least potent enough to justify its use, I don't want to inject something on a daily basis. I just do not. So this is where I had to figure out, is this going to be orally bioavailable enough to actually produce significant outcomes at a higher dose. So this is where I dug into the literature again, looking at the bioavailability and structural studies of ectosterone complexes with cyclodextrins, like I just mentioned with the, how good of a basis a cyclodextrin was for the creation of a hydrophilic substance. And basically as I got into the literature, I realized that the absolute best way to go about this was complexing the turkesterone or ectosterone, whichever one we were gonna go with, with hydroxypropyl beta cyclodextrin. And this is also what I complexed our berberine with in our glucose disposal agent product for maximum bioavailability. Like you'll probably, some, uh, some companies are using um, cyclodextrin complexes for their uh, berberine, but this is like, from what I've seen in the literature and as well as from deferring to people I consider smarter than myself, um, hydroxypropyl beta cyclodextrin is the go-to complex for achieving as good of oral bioavailability as you will via this substance. So for me, turkesterone does not actually act, it's not actually implied that it has poor bioavailability in the studies. It's more so these studies showing this significant enhancement of bioavailability of ectosterone. And then by consequence, I'm just assuming that turkesterone is poor and I also have to go about this route of administration. So that's what we did. We ended up getting the proper standardization of turkesterone at 10%. Um, and then above and beyond that, we had to complex it with the hydroxypropyl beta cyclodextrin in order to get this overall orally bioavailable version of it, hopefully, that is going to produce a very significant effect or significant enough to justify its use. And this is, the reason I chose this over ectosterone is because of the data I showed you again that shows it is more potent milligram for milligram at building muscle than ectosterone. So of all the phytoectosteroids, it seems like the most potent one. And um, there's a lot of literature that indicates, you know, how it increases muscle protein synthesis and, you know, reduces myostatin and does all this crazy shit. And like this video is going to end up being very long. If I actually show it all, I actually have about like 15 studies up in front of me that I was going to show and this video is pushing 35 minutes already. So I, if I do a follow-up video in the future, I guess I can, but I mean like for me, the main stuff is the stuff I showed you guys that actually made me interested in the compound to begin with. So like when you compare it head to head against the other phytoectosteroids, it's the most potent one, milligram for milligram. Anecdotally in humans, it seems like 
the best results are seen with turkesterone use as opposed to the other phytoecticeroids um, orally as well. And this is like what I've seen through actual people using this shit at a high enough dose to actually realize the benefits of it. We actually had a guy in-house log his progress too over five weeks. This is a natural. He tracked his progress using a in-body 270, 270 device where he works at the gym. Um, like obviously I don't hold a lot of merit in these fucking body fat estimating devices or anything like that. I'm just showing you a log as a form of anecdotal reporting here for the sake of, because we have it. And he seemed to be happy with his results and it sort of reinforced um, my confidence in proceeding with the product because this guy has a pretty firm understanding of his body. Um, he's a natural who has plateaued and has been basically at his genetic limits for a while and um, decided to push the envelope by trying this. And, you know, we got some decent metrics to go off of. Again, this is this is an experimental product. I, like, I'm not trying to say it's gonna do any of this shit. So this is why I only, it was very expensive to make and I only ordered a limited amount because it is largely going to be up to people who are actually interested in leveraging these vectors like I am to experiment with. And if it's successful, then I'll get more made. But for now, it's going to be a very limited run that's going to be based on kind of like feedback. So this is like, I'm not trying to market this as like the next fucking big thing. This is actually sort of like interaction with the community to find out if this is the next big thing or not. Because getting this this actual standardization of turkesterone as well as complex complexing it the way I did, nobody's done this yet. No other company has this on the market and we're gonna see if it makes a fucking big difference. So anyways, this guy, he took his progress using the InBody 270. Um, basically started in July 15th and he ended up August 20th after five weeks. Says the in-body isn't totally accurate, but does show an honest trend over a period of time. The three lines on the picture of the in-body represent the three metrics. The top line representing total body weight. The second line representing skeletal muscle mass. And the bottom line representing percentage of body fat. I took the test post-workout at the same time each week for consistency purposes. So anyways, you see the body weight trending up. You see the body fat netting the same amount by the end. Um, and you see skeletal muscle mass increasing. Now, how much do I, you know, take from this? Not a whole lot, but it's <laughs> it's worth, it's one of, uh, I trust this guy very, um, a lot. He is a very uh, credible guy who definitely would do a controlled experiment properly and not uh, fuck with it too much. So like it was worth reporting because he did a very controlled run of it. As a guy, like it's one thing for a guy who has like multiple factors varying all the time, but with this guy, he's like maxed out his genetic potential essentially. He's really like plateaued, hasn't really done a whole lot different and now introduces this one variable and then you see a significant change. You know, you can only hope that it's the thing, you know what I mean? So as far as like anecdotal reports from other individuals, some people report gains as much as like four to five pounds of muscle in a span of a few months. Now, I don't know, um, or actually it's probably closer to like two months cause it's like a, people are usually doing like six to eight week cycles of this stuff and on paper, Theoretically, you should not have to limit your runs to six to eight weeks because this does not operate through a mechanism that provides negative feedback that shuts you down, or at least it doesn't seem to through the data that shows it has no interaction with negative HPTA suppression. So, you know, like we'll, we'll see, dude. Like this is something that I am very interested in and I am going to be deploying into my protocol and reason being is because I don't want to inject the shit. So if this works orally as well as it does injected just that by mega dosing it, then awesome. We might've just found like the next big product in the industry because this is something that is literally looking at being added to banned substance lists in WADA. It is naturally derived from plants and it is on paper more potent than Dianable and rodent models, which again, though, that's kind of like you know, how much can you take from that comparison? Not a whole lot, but still the fact that it stacks up the best against all of the other phytoecticeroids, it makes me like feel confident about my decision in choosing this one. And it seems like nobody has gone about it the way we've done it, where anybody who gets it, they don't have the right standardization. They just have the raw plant and they just sell like a fucking bag of this shit with some like not even specified standardization of how potent it is. And then above and beyond that, they don't complex it. So you don't know how bioavailable this stuff is. You don't even know if it's getting absorbed. We're just assuming that what happens when people buy this stuff raw, it's representative of, you know, 
like what it can do. And I, I don't necessarily think that's the case because it seems like of the people I've seen even using it not complexed at the right standardization, they're the ones who were getting like a few pounds of muscle in four to six weeks, supposedly, at least according to them. Those, like those are those reports, not mine. So we're going to see what happens when we actually have this thing maxed out, complexed fully, blah, 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 proper standardization. And uh, I'll be running it too. So let's see what happens. And if it is, uh, you know, if people like it, then I'll get more. And if it sucks and no one likes it, then I won't. But, you know, I want to give it a chance because it seems like a very novel anabolic agent that goes through a totally different vector. Like all these other products in the industry, it's like, oh, how, let's take the most garbage pro hormone that we can find off like the archives of the chemistry books from the 60s, some trash garbage steroid that the scientists literally said was too dangerous and shitty to even bother with trying to pursue in clinical research in humans because it was so much worse than the anabolics that got approved for human use. Those like Frankenstein chemicals are the ones that are resurrected and then put into the pro hormone industry and sold as side effect free steroids to like 17 year olds and shit that end up shutting them down and making them have to do PCT and ruining their livers and whatnot. So for me, something that is not a pro hormone through the anabolic androgenic, you know, pathway, it operates through a totally different mechanism that is not androgenic, won't cause HPTA suppression, won't cause all these issues that pro hormones cause, and isn't some Frankenstein resurrected piece of shit that you literally know in your head when you're selling it, that you pulled it from some garbage bin of steroids that sucks that was rejected 50 years ago this is a totally different thing through a totally different vector that is relatively unexplored and i think it has a lot of promise for not only natties but for guys on gear so we shall see and uh i look forward to testing it out myself and i look forward to anybody else who wants to test it out so as far as where it's gonna be um like the product this is kind of a video introduction to its launch and to be honest i don't actually know if we're going to uh I don't know how popular it's gonna be or how many people are gonna want it. So I'm actually going to put a limited opportunity to buy it up. So I want people to subscribe to my newsletter, which will be the only people that will get sent the link to the private product page. And then from there, you will, uh, I'll put out the newsletter blast in a few days after this video is up. So everyone's had an opportunity to watch the video. And then if you're on the list, you will get the link sent to you of Turkesterone complex with hydroxypropyl cyclodextrin on our product page. And from there, you'll have an opportunity to get it and trial it yourself. Like I want to get it in the hands of the people that are like actually going to experiment with it properly and log it and kind of like know what the fuck is good, what is up and kind of have watched through my full video and know what to expect from this stuff because I don't want just random people to get it and like not know what the hell it is and like ask me a million questions when I just did a 50 minute deep dive on it. So it'll be a limited run, like I said, a very limited access only to people who like want to experiment with it the way I am. And then from there, if it's uh, successful and people like it and the feedback is good, you know, we'll probably order more. And then the product page will probably just open up to the public. I, I actually don't even know how I'm going to run this kind of like sale or whatever. For the first like week though, it'll definitely be private and just have like uh, people with the link will be able to get it. And then after that, we'll probably open it up. And then the rest of everyone can uh, flood it and grab it. But for now, if you want to get it now, subscribe to the newsletter. First link in the description below and I'll send out a newsletter blast in a few days after the views have kind of tapered off of this video, like I said, and then, uh, you know, we can trial it out and then the product page will open up after that. And it'll make sure everyone who actually like watch the content and understands what they're getting themselves into has gotten it before just random, like general people who are like, Oh, new product, buy it. And then let me send Derek a DM asking like 50 questions that he's already <laughs> answered in his video or something. So I don't know, but after that, we'll have it open up to the general public. And then hopefully by then everyone's kind of seen the content and kind of knows what to expect. So that is the plan as of now, if it changes, then I will put a pinned comment down below, but I think that might be the best way to make sure the right people get their hands on the product first and we don't sell out and have a bunch of like non helpful feedback, I guess, you know what I mean? So anyways, newsletter, first link description below if you wanna be on the list to get sent the drop of the Tricasterone product and uh, let's see what happens. So thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplatesmoredates.com. Oh, as far as how I'm gonna be using it, I am going to be using at least 2000 milligrams a day. So each capsule is 500 milligrams each and i will be using at minimum four spread into two daily dosages i'm going to be using two in the morning two at night i'll probably taper up to three in the morning three at night to be honest the suggested use on the bottle is two in the morning two at night or to be honest you could use one in the morning and one at night if you're a girl or if you're just like introducing yourself to it and 
I don't know, like I think it would scale up with body weight demand and whatnot, as well as just kind of like as assessing your response to it in general, you should probably titrate up, but ideally you would eventually get to at least two in the morning, two at night, if you wanted to max out and kind of see exactly what it can do. Um, and that's what I'm gonna be starting at personally. So play it by ear though. It's gonna be kind of up to you how you wanna run about it, but that is my suggestion. Start off with one in the morning, one at night and taper up accordingly. And um, yeah, we shall see. 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams per day is what I am going to be testing out. So we shall see. So thank you guys for watching. Like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplatesmoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram, at moreplates underscore more dates, Facebook, Snapchat, Pitch, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. Um, if you want to save another 10% too on the Gorilla Mind products, DC10, I don't ever remember to say that, but it is a functioning coupon code that will save you 10% off your full order when you check out. So thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.